to review for your module four exam. This is your fourth exam. You have one other exam other than this and then your final exam. So um, with this, this exam will be given online to you. You'll take it from the comfort of your home. Make sure you set aside two hours to take it. Um, I cannot stop you from using notes and homeworks and that sort of thing. However, I will tell you it will time out on you after two hours. So if you get too caught up in trying to look up answers, it's not going to be a pretty sight for you. Anything you don't finish after that is just going to time out on you. And anything after that would be marked as zero. So I'll know already from that that you don't know the material on your own. Otherwise, the exam itself should take you maybe an hour to do if you truly know the material. So make sure you do the review ahead of time. And that's what this here is. These problems come from your IMATH as review. Um, I did not do all, let's see, 39 of them. I only did about um, 18, 19 of them uh, that were most like the ones that were on your test. Many of the others are repeats. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of do one of each to make sure you had a pretty good review. So here we go. Um, here is one of them. This is actually number one on your exam review. Um, it's more like number 17 on your test, which I'm not going to tell you that from question to question because I did same, change some question numbers around, so I don't want you to quote me on any of those. Uh, but it says the following functions model the anticipated population of various towns in terms of the number of years N since 2011. What was the population in 2011? So since this is talking about the year that it started, that means if you remember our y equals ab to the x, this is your initial population. So that is the population for 2011. Then it says by what percent does the population change each year as the number of years since 2011 increases? Well, remember, your B value is 1.45. This is called your growth factor. This is not a percentage. And so what I have to do is take the one away and move the decimal place over in order to figure out what the actual rate is. The rate is 45%, and there you have it as a percentage. Next, use function notation. Keywords right there, function notation. That means like F of something, H of something. To represent the anticipated population of the town in the year 2020, well, subtract the year 2011 from it. They're talking about after nine years. So that means since this function is called H of N, we're going to say just H of nine. You do not have to calculate it in that problem unless they ask you to. And that's what the next question is. What is the anticipated population in the town in 2020? And that's where you're going to actually take and find it. 7,087 times 1.45 to the ninth power. Of course, that is just a calculator. Um, you should get about 200,800 people. All right, then here we have part B, similar. It's giving another one. What is the population in the town? Well, that's your A value or your 1,200. By what percentage does the population change? Take the 1.03, take the one off, move it over. You get 0.03 changes to 3% there. And then again, use function notation. This one's called F, so it's F of something to represent the anticipated population in 2025. Subtract 2011 from that, it gives you 14 years, so F of 14. And then finally on part B, what is the anticipated population? And that's where you actually calculate it out. 1200 times 1 1.03 to the 14th power. And then from there, pop it into your calculator. And for that one, you end up with a population of about 1,816 people. So a much smaller town right there than uh, what the original one was. So now let's go to a large town. So part C, a much bigger town. And oh my goodness, check this out. This is a number smaller than one. That means it is growth. All right, so first, what is the population in 2011? 58,024. 
by what percentage does it grow? So we have the 0.85. Before we took the one away, which meant we were subtracting one. So when we subtract one from this, we get negative 0.15. Then we have to move the decimal over. Still, we get negative 15%. Remember, when something is decaying, its percentage is always a negative. Then use function notation to represent the anticipated population in 2013. I would have to subtract 2011. They're talking about two years later. This function is called g, so g of 2. And then what is the actual population? So that is where you would take and plug the 2 into the problem. Here we go. And when we do, we end up getting about 41,923 people. So you can see that's the same kind of problem done three times uh, with different populations growth and then different names for those functions as well. Okay, next we have, um, this is number five on your review. Um, it says a typical cup of coffee contains about 80 milligrams of caffeine and every hour approximately 13% is metabolized and eliminated. Write the definition of a function named K that expresses the amount of caffeine in the body in milligrams as a function of T. So this right here is telling me that this has to be K of T. When I start out. So if you put in y equals, your I math as will mark you wrong. So you want to be very specific with that. It's the same with the online test. The online test will only take an exact answer. So you need to learn to be exact. Um, since the, um, the coffee was consumed. All right. So here you're starting with 80 milligrams. So that's your initial value. That is your A value right there. Okay. Then it says it is um, metabolized or eliminated. That means this is a negative 13%. And so what that means is when I take and do my, um, change it to a decimal, negative 0.13, and then I take 1 minus that, I get 0.87 for my B value on that. So since it's going down, it needs to be, that's a, let me fix that. It looks like a negative and a decimal all at once, and it's supposed to just be a decimal 0.87 right there, and then to the T power. So there's part A, your function, and then it says how much caffeine is in the body after four hours, and t since this problem is talking about hours, then this is just my T, so I have 80 times 0.87 to the fourth power for my calculator, which gives me 45.83 milligrams. So with that right there, that is um, why when you have a cup of coffee or something with caffeine, whether it's pop, coffee, chocolate, you know, anything like that that has the caffeine, you kind of, you know, get uplifted and then that wears off. <laughs> this is an example of that wearing off right there. All right, next one, let's see, let me find which number this is. This is number nine in your review. It says, use the tables to answer the following questions. And so they have an initial value of 213. Oh, that's the first question, sorry. Whenever I see a zero there, I automatically think that's an initial value whenever it's zero. The one unit growth factor is where I'm going to take y2 divided by y1 here. So to get this value, it's 110.76 divided by 213. And when I do get that, I end up getting 0.52. So the one unit growth factor is 0.52. So this is like saying this is your B value is 0.52 right here. So then when it says, what is the percent change? All right, well, remember, I have to take and subtract 1 from it. So 0.52 minus 1 is negative 0.48, and then I need to move the decimal over 2. So we have negative 48%. And then it says, can you write the function? Again, be exact. Don't just put y equals because up here in the chart it has this is called f of x for this function, whereas like the next one is called g of x. So f of x equals, you start with your initial value, 
my board is doing something weird. There we go. And then we need our B value. And then to whatever letter is here to the X power. Let's do it again down here. Oh, but this one does not give me the zero. It doesn't give me the initial value that I need right here in order to know that initial value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start down here with the growth factor in order to get it. I'm going to take the 19.7136 and divide it by 17.76. This here gives me 1.11. So that answers part B. But then what I could do is now I can go back up to part A and I can take the 17.76 and divide by the 1.11 and that's going to give me then the answer that I need for this, which is 16. All right, then from there, the 1% change, well, I need to subtract 1 from this and move the decimal place over. So 11% would be my percent change. And then write the function. Again, I'm going to use g of x because that's what's given in this problem. My initial times my b value, and then since it's an x, I have an x up there. Okay, and then there's just a hint there. Remember, the initial value is the value of the function when the value of x is 0. And so when it's not given, I have to go and I have to find it. Okay, moving right along here. The next one on your review would be number 11 on your review. It says the value of a car depreciates. This means it goes down in value. It means my B value is going to be less than 1. Suppose that you purchase a car for 23000 and the value of the car depreciates by 12% each year. All right, so the initial value of the car would be your $23,000. The one-year growth factor, well, you'd have to take the 1 minus your 0.12 um, in order to get that. It's, it's decaying by 12%, so it's minus 12%, and minus 12%, when you move the decimal place, is minus 0.12, so 1 minus 0.12 is 0.88 for that. The one-year percent change is negative 12%. Part B, define a function called F that determines the value of the car in terms of the number of years since the car was purchased. So this is asking for F of X right here. And again, it's 23,000 times 0.88 to the X. So again, we're just using on each of these problems Y equals AB to the X. You don't use the PERT formula unless it says continuous in the problem. And you don't need to use the one that's 1 plus R over N to the NT power unless it's talking about anything other than each year. So like uh, monthly or quarterly type of thing. Then it says determine the value of the car nine years after it was purchased. You may round your answer to the nearest penny. So I'm going to say 23,000 times 0.88 to the ninth power. And when I put that into my calculator, I end up on this one. Here, let me just show you. It actually works okay. 23,000 times 0.88 to the ninth power. And it comes out to the nearest penny here, if you look at it, it has 0, 0 right over here. And so this is just $7,279 and no cents for that particular problem. Okay, the next one we're going over is like number 13 on your, um, your test or your exam. In 2012, your car was worth $10,000. In 2014, your car was worth $7,900. So let's call this year zero, then this would be two years later. If you like looking at these as charts, you certainly could do that. You could say at a time of zero, it was 10,000. At a time of two, it was 7,900. So to help you find your B value, if it is um, exponential, you would take and divide them. But look at this problem. In part A, it says define a 
linear function and in part b an exponential function and that's exactly the way it is on your test as well if it's linear it says define a linear function f that determines the value of the car in terms of the number of years t since 2012. so this is what it's asking for but remember linear means y equals mx plus b where m is the slope B is the y-intercept. So we have our 10,000 right there, but what we have le are left to find is what the slope is. Well, if you have two points, don't you know how to find the slope? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So this is negative 2,100 divided by 2, which is negative 1,050 for your slope. So there is your equation for that right there. But they wanted it as f of t. So negative 1050x, oh sorry, t I guess I'm going to have to use since they asked for it, plus 10,000. Then in part b, so that like that part a goes back to the last chapter with all the linear equations we were talking about. Now part B is saying, okay, well what about with what we've been talking about here? They want it in terms of G of T. So here's G of T. The initial value is 10,000, but I don't know my growth factor. My growth factor is just taking Y2 divided by Y1, which is 0.79. Now, would it make sense that that is a number that is, um, oh goodness, it's not 0.79. This right here is my two-year growth factor. I would need to take and say 0.79 to the one out of two years, which, let's go do that on our calculator, 0.79 to the one divided by two. It gives me 0.89. So let me just correct that real quick. 0.89. Very easy to make that mistake though right there if we're not paying attention to this, you know, how many years are there. If there's one year there, it doesn't make a difference. But if there's two, then I need to take and find that the B value, what the B value is for one year. Okay, next we hop to number 14 on your review. This one right here says the following table relates the weight of garbage in tons to the time, T in years, since 1984. It is known that the relationship is exponential. So most of this test is exponential. You have that one linear question there but um, that you had on the last one. Use the table to answer the following questions. What is the two-year growth factor? Notice these are spread apart by two years up here. So I'm just going to take I'm just going to take these two here. What is 3,715.2 divided by 2,580? And it comes out to 1.44. So that is your two-year growth factor. Then it says, what is your one-year percent change? Well, first you'd want to find your one-year growth factor and then change it to a percent. So let's see, 1.44, I need one year out of the two years. That gives me 0.12. All right, then from there, remember, we have to subtract 1, which we get negative 0.88, and then we have to move the decimal place over 2 right there. What did I do wrong there? Oh, I have a, sorry, I, I have this wrong. This is supposed to be 1.2. When I did that, I in my head, I didn't just get that correct right there. 1.2, when I subtract 1 from it, I get 0 0.20, which then move the decimal place over, and I get a 20% change. And then it says, what is the weight of the garbage in 1982? Now remember, this is 1984 right here, okay? And so if I want to go back two years right there, right, to get to, what do they want, 1982? 1982, 
I'm going to have to take this and divide it by the two-year growth factor. So I'm going to take 2,580 and divide it by the two-year growth factor, since I'm going back two years, which is dividing by 1.44, to give me 1,791.67 tons of trash. So you can see here that many times the information they give in these problems is very real. They get it from somewhere. Look at the weight that garbage is since 1984. Now, we're way beyond 1984. Imagine how much we have now with all the plastic bottles and everything that have come out since then. Kind of crazy. All right, next we hop to number 16 on the review. It says there were 27 deer in a park on January 1st of 2000. Six months later, there were 38 deer in the same park. Assume that the number of the deer in the park will, uh, with respect to the number of months since January 1st, can be modeled by an exponential function. All right, so I think for this one right here, I probably would set up a chart for myself to say, you know, at month zero, there were 27 deer. But six months later, there were 38 deer. So if I want to find, oh, and that's the first question, determine the six-month growth factor, I'm going to take 38 divided by 27 and get point, oh, sorry, 1.407. Then it says determine the six-month percent change. Well, I'm going to take that 1.407, take the one away, so that's subtracting one, move the decimal, gives me 40.7%. Then it says determine the one month growth factor. Well, I have to go back to this six month and say what would one out of the six months be? And so when I do that, I get 1.0586. And then determine the one month percent change. We'll take that 1.0586, subtract one, move the decimal over, and you have yourself 5.86. So we've kind of done a couple of those, you know, so far um, today, but you're going to see that that's important on this test. It then says define a function G that relates the number of the deer in the park reserve in terms of the number of months that have elapsed since January 1st. Um, now, notice they're using N here as the number of months. So this is G of N for this equation. Um, and this is assume that it, you know, they increase by the same percent each month. So I want the one month percent change to be my B value. This is my B value right here. My A value is how many I started with, 27. So 27 times 5.86 to the N power right there. Again, watch for things like that. Once the computer does grade your test, I do plan on going back into each one and looking at problems that are missed and seeing if I can give you any points back on little things like if you use a T instead of an N and like that. But I sure would appreciate it if you'd be careful, you know, and just do it properly the first time uh, because that would save me a lot of time as well. All right, the next one is like number 18 on the um, exam or the review that you have in IMATH as. This says for this function, determine the, t the following values. The initial value, 9. The one unit growth factor, 0.78. The two unit growth factor, take the 0.78 to the second power. And when you do, you end up getting 0 0.6084. The two-unit percent change. Well, the two-unit percent change, well, we take the two-unit growth factor, subtract one from it. We get negative 0.3916. Then move the decimal over two, you get minus 39.16%. What about the half-unit growth factor? Well, if we're going to take the two-unit growth factor, take that 0.78 to the second power, here we're going to take it to the one-half power, and we get 0.883. And then the one-unit percent change, well, subtract one, we get 0.117. 
sorry, negative 0.117, and then move the decimal over 2, you get negative 11.7%. All right, the next one we have here is number 21 from your review. Um, and this puts us about halfway through the test review here as well. If you invest $1,200 in a CD, remember a CD is that money market certificate of deposit, with an APR of 3.5% compounded monthly, the expression 1,200 times 1 plus 0 0.035 to divided by 12, to the 12 times 6, um, we'll calculate the value of the CD in six years. Match each part of the expression with what it represents in the calculation. So the first thing here, we have just this piece of it. And this right here is talking about, um, it, like just divide it out, see what it gives you. That, that might even be helpful, you know, for you in determining it. 0 0.035 divided by 12. You know, what do you think that tells you right there, you know, within the problem? And that right there is actually the monthly, notice it's a decimal, um, and it is actually the monthly percent change written as a decimal. Because remember, 12 is months. So it has something to do with monthly, okay? Then we have 1 plus 0 0.035. Um, to the 12th power, which is this entire thing in here. This is like your B value. It is actually your growth factor that you see. The reason it has the word monthly is there is because there is the divide by 12 within it. The next one is 12 times 6. That is what you have up here. This is the number of months times the number of years. It's how many times it's actually calculated over that six years. And that's what part E is referring to, the number of times interest is compounded in the six years. Okay, the next thing we have is this part, oops, almost put my box around too much of it here. This part right here, without the 1,200 and without the six, Okay, so that right there is referring to um, just your B value, like your entire B value. If it was written as Y equals AB to the X, this would be A, this would be the X, and so the rest of it is the annual growth factor for the whole year right there. And then finally, the last part, well, least but not last here, we have the sixth year growth factor, it's taking the growth factor to the sixth power right there. So many times what it says kind of gives away what it's referring to. This next one is number 23 on the IMAF as review. Sue decides to start saving money for a new car. She knows she can invest money into an account which will earn 7.5% APR. Um, compounded monthly and would like to have saved $15,000 after six years. How much money will she need to invest into the account now so that she has $15,000 after six years? So with this right here, it is um, APR. This is compounded monthly right here. We know that we want to use the formula. Let me put it up here first. We know that she wants to have 15,000 in the end. Okay. This is how much will she need to invest. That's the P value. And then it says the rate is 7.5%, so 0 0.075. Compounded monthly, that's giving me a 12. And for six years. All right, so next I can take this entire piece and I can pop it into my calculator. So let me kind of show you how that goes there. So I would start just like it has, a parenthesis, one plus. Now right here there's a fraction, so I might press the alpha y equals to put that fraction there to say 0 0.075 over 12. Then get out of the fraction, put your right parenthesis. And then go to the power here, and this power is, for this problem, um, 12 times 6, we said. 12 times 6 
or you could put a 72 if you have already calculated that. And that would give you that value, 1.5661, etc. And then there's the P coming down. Then from there, divide both sides by that 1.5661, dot, dot, dot. And from here, we say 15,000 divided by second answer. And it gives us $9,577.83. That is how much money she will need to, do, to uh, put in there in order to have that amount. So $9,577.83. Money, we always do two decimal places unless they say otherwise. Okay, next then are a couple of other questions. Determine the APY. You might remember we had APR and we had APY. APR is the amount that the bank always advertises. But because you're getting paid extra money on your money throughout the year, the APY is usually a little bit higher than the APR. So the APY, if you go back over to your work, you can actually get this value by finding this right here, just this, well, actually we have it right here, 1.5661 right there, or, well, leave the six off, hold on, leave the six off, just this part right here, which when I put that in my calculator, I get 1.07763. Subtract the one off, so we get 0 0.07763, and then move the decimal over. So you get 7.763%, even though the bank told you you're only going to get 7.5. And then it says determine the six-year percent change, and that's what this entire thing is here, which is this. So if you take 1.5661 and you want to change it to a percent change, subtract the 1, you get 0.5661, and move the decimal over. So 56.61%. All right, so like I said, that was question number eight on the review. Or no, it wasn't. It was 23 on the review. Sorry, I've got too many numbers on my papers right here. This one here is number 25 on your review. It says, suppose an initial population of 32 million people increases at a continuous percentage rate of 1.7% per year since the year 2000. Determine the function F that gives the population in millions um, in terms of the number of years T since 2000. So the first thing I know just reading that without doing any work is I have this right here, F of T. They're giving me these when I read this. The initial population is 32 million. So since they're saying it's in millions already, I can just say 32. I don't need to put six zeros after that. It's growing at a continuous percentage rate. This word continuous right here is telling me I'm using the PERT formula. So next comes E, not my B value. Then my rate, which is 0 0.017, and at a time of t, so times t. This is determine the population in the year 2019. So I'd have to take 2019 minus the year 2000 that it started, and that would mean it's saying I need to plug a 19 in for the time. So I have 32e to the point zero one seven times 19. All right, so that means I go to my calculator and I type it in. 32, remember e is right down here on the left side with the natural log. 0 0.017 times 19 goes up in the exponent there. Uh, I think I left a number off there though. Wait, 0, 0.017 times 19, there we go. And I get 44.2 million people. Next, what is the annual growth factor of this right here? All right, well, so for the growth factor, I'm going to take this part. 
I'm going to leave off the P. I'm going to leave off the T. I'm going to count everything else, just like I did for the growth factor with the B value before. I'm going to look at what E to the 0 0.017 is on my calculator. Oops, sorry, wrong thing. Second E to the 0 0.017. And this here, oops, I typed it in wrong. 0 0.017. Which gives me 1.017, right like that. That is my annual growth factor, 1.017. What does your answer in Part C represent in this context? And for this particular problem in your review, you get to select an answer. It says each year the population is 1.017. And I think what's under here is times, you're actually multiplying the population of the previous year. Next one is a matching, and you do have one or two matching on the test, just like we already did one matching. It says match the equivalent representations. So in other words, if you were to change them into logarithmic form, now remember, the two that are together get separated, the other guy comes between them. So here is what you would have for this one. Log base 3 of k equals 12. That is answer b. All right, for the next one, changing it to log form. The two that are together get separated. The other guy comes between them. Well, that one there looks kind of like oh, num a right there. So this one's b, this one's a. All right, then moving on to the next one. And you can see it's the same process for each one. Log base 2 equals 3 of k. Log base 2 of k equals 3 would be e. So that one is e. For the next one, we have the two that are together get separated. The other guy comes between them. Log base 2 of 3 equals k is f. And then let's see. Log the two that are together get separated. The other guy comes between them. Hopefully you know that saying because you can see I'm using it quite a lot. And then finally, the two that are together get separated. The other guy comes between them. Log base 3 of 2 equals K. That is then D. So as long as you can get those and it's, you notice it would be very easy to mix those up because all I'm using there are, is 3, 2, and K and just coming up with all the different combinations you possibly could have. All right, the next problem, this is number 27 in your review. It says determine the value of the unknown in each of the following equations. All right, so here are some of our log rules. Remember, natural log means it has a base of E. Once these two are the same, the answer is just the exponent, so the answer there is 4. For this one right here, my unknown happens to be here, not over here like it was in the last one. But what I would probably do is rewrite this as natural log of e to the negative k. It's in the denominator. I could pull it to the top and change the exponent to negative, equals negative 6. Since these bases are the same, these cancel, giving me negative k equals negative 6, which means k is 6 in that problem. In the next one, okay, this one here is not as common, but we did talk about it. If you ever have e to a logarithm or a base to a logarithm and these two numbers are the same, then 4x comes down for that side of it. You end up with an equation 4x equals 24. Divide both sides by 4, and you get x is 6 for that problem. And then this one here, the base is e. That means these are the same, so this all cancels, giving me just m. And so m equals 8. Those there, are there other ways to do them? Yes, but that is the easiest way. So if you don't have that down pretty good, well, you might want to go back and rewatch the video on that section with the logarithms. Okay, next, this is number 28 in the review. Rewrite the following expressions as a single logarithm. All right, so we have some logarithm rules that say, if we have multiple logs, we could rewrite them as a single log as long as they have the same base and I have addition and subtraction between them. So they get written with that single log right there. 
But then I have to remember that this multiplication or this addition changes to multiplication. So we get 7 times 40 times 45, which actually, and that comes out to 12,600. So I get log base 5 of 12,600. On the next one, same kind of thing. The addition changes to multiplication. They have the same base. So I have 1 tenth times 1 28th, which is 1 over 280. And so there's my answer for that. And then we also talked about how if you have a number in front of a log, it can go to the exponent. So this is going to be rewritten as log base 6 of 2 squared, which is 4, plus log base 6 of 8. Since they have the same log base and an addition in between, the addition can be changed to multiplication, and 4 times 8 is 32. So log base 6 of 32. All right, this next one right here is um, question number 30 on your um, test review. It says, using the laws of logarithms, write the exp expressions below using sums or differences. So now it's giving it to you as a single log, and they want you to break it apart. So it's the exact opposite of the last one. Um, and it, say, it says of logarithmic expressions which do not contain logarithms of products, quotients, or powers. Use decimals instead of fractions, and if the expression cannot be expanded, just put an n. So this first one right here is exactly that, an n. The fact that it has subtraction with a single log already means there's nothing I can do. It has to have, have multiplication, division, or exponents in order to do anything. So for this next one right here, it has division. So I'm going to change the division to subtraction. But that means I need to make sure that the 4 has its own log and the y has its own log as well. What's in the denominator is what goes after the minus sign. This next one right here has multiplication. So that means I can give each one of them their own logarithm, like so, with an addition sign. Um, so the multiplication breaks up into addition. However, we also want to expand this out. Log of 7 plus 9 log of A. So if it has an exponent, the exponent's going to move out front. Next, determine the value of the unknown in each of the following equations. If no possible value of X, make the statement then tr uh, true, then right does not exist. All right, so each of these has logarithms. We have to remember when we get an answer, we have to go and plug it back in and make sure that it's not trying to take the log of a negative, like this one here. I know right now that one does not exist because I cannot take the log of a negative number. Oh, and I did not tell you either. This one is like number 33 um, on your review. All right, so for that first one right there, I think that is a typo on this. Um, or, well, I guess it's not. If these bases are not the same, there's nothing I can do about it. We're going to put does not exist for that one. However, if they were the same, what could we do? So let's try the problem as though they were both like base 7, just so that you can see the work, because I don't... I'm not going to give you many that say do not exist. I'm going to give you more that have the work to do. All right, so these two right here, when they do have the same base, it would be where I would take and change the addition to multiplication. And then I would subtract 1 from both sides as well. So this gives me log base 7 of 18x equals 3. Then from here, I would take and get rid of the logarithm by changing it to exponential form. So these two that are together get separated, and this guy comes between them. 7 to the third is 343 equals 18x, and divide both sides by 18. Your x value would just be 343 divided by 18. So that's if the bases were the same. When they're not the same, it means you cannot do the problem, though. 
All right, this next one right here, well, oh, let me switch colors so that it doesn't get mixed up with the other over here. I'm going to pull it right here. I'm going to change it out of logarithmic form. The two that are together get separated. The other guy comes between them. Well, 7 to the third, we just did it over on this problem, is 343. You could either have 1 over 343, or if you put it in your calculator, you would get 0 .00292. So actually, either one of those answers would be accepted. Okay, and then this last one right here. Um, first, I'm going to have to get rid of this outside log. Here's a log with a base, and then this equals zero. So changing it to exponential form, the two that are together, which are these two, I'm going to say 3 equals log base 4 of x, and this guy comes between them. I'm going to set it up like that. Well, anything to the 0 power is 1, so that got rid of one of the logarithms right there. Now from here, I'm going to do it again. Sorry, my writing was too sloppy right there. These two that are together get separated, and this guy comes between them. And so here, x is 4, and that's the answer to that part d. All right, next one here. This one is like number 38 on your review. The following functions give the population of three towns in terms of the number of years T since 1985. Use this information to answer the following questions. And so for this one right here, it says let L represent the population of Linwood. And here the equation is given. Notice it is growing. This is then, N represents the population of Northfield. It's also growing. And then S represents the population of Summers Point, which this one is decaying. That town's getting smaller. It says, in what year will the population of Linwood predicted to be um, 9,850 people? So we're going to go back to the Linwood equation, which is this one. And in place of L, we're going to put 9,850 equals 8397 times 1.06 to the t, and we're going to solve for t. So in order to do that, you're going to divide both sides by your, whoops, that's not a decimal, 8,397. And when you do, you get 1.173 equals 1.06 to the t, because these cancel on this side. And then you're going to change it into exponential, or sorry, logarithmic form. These two that are together get separated, and this guy comes between them, and then it becomes a calculator piece. So that right there, when you put it into your calculator, is 2.74 years for your time. But this said in what year, not after how many years, but in what year. So if this was talking about the year 1995, I'm going to have to take 1995 plus 2.74, which is then in the year 1997 that it's going to happen. Next it says, again, in what year will the population of Northfield predicted to be 13,400 people? So now we're going to take the equation for Northfield and plug that 13,400 in equals 6,431 times 1.1 to the t. And all of these, the work is just the same. Divide by that number that's next to the parenthesis. That there end up, ends up giving you 2.083657, it keeps going, equals 1.1 to the t power. Change it into logarithmic form. The two that are together get separated, and this other guy comes between them and then plug it into your calculator. This ends up giving you 7.7 .7 years, but it says in what year, so I have to take 1995 and add 7.7 .7 years to it. That would be in the year 2002. Notice you might be tempted to round either of those up to the next year, but remember, that just means it's like three-fourths of the way through the year right there. And then in what year was the population of Summers Point predicted to be 11,220? So we're going to do the same thing, just taking the right equation. So make sure you're grabbing the right equation right there. 
all of the work is the same on all of them, you know, as far as, you know, what you're dividing to get rid of the number that's next to the parentheses. Then you're changing it into logarithmic form. For this here, it comes out 0.837688 equals 0.84 to the t. And then changing it into logarithmic form, these two that are together get separated, and this guy comes between them. So plugging that in, I get 1.0158. Adding that to 1995, I end up getting in the year 1996. It will hit that population. Okay, and then this is the last one for this review. Um, this is number 39 from the review itself. It says the following table relates the weight of garbage in tons to the time and year since 1984. Environmentalists decided that this relationship is exponential. Notice exponential, not continuous. It means y equals ab to the x. Okay. Use the table to answer the following questions. What is the one-year growth factor? Well, if I have any of these x values that differ by one year, I could take that y value divided by the other, but they don't. So I'm just going to take these two and divide them. This is going to give me the three-year, or sorry, the two-year growth factor. Why two? Because three minus one is two, okay? When I divide that out, I end up getting 1.44. This is the two-year growth factor, so if I want to know one out of the two years, I end up getting 1.2. So the one-year growth factor is 1.2. Then it says, what is the weight of the garbage in 1984? Notice this is one year after 1984, so this is 1985. So 1984 would be when this is zero right here. So what I would have to do is I would need to take the 2,580, and in order to go back one year, I would need to divide by the one-year growth factor. When I do that, I get 2,150, and that would be tons of trash. And this is define a rule for the function d. Notice it's giving the d of x right here. You need the initial value, which is the year in 1984, or the amount in 1984, times the one-year growth factor, and then make sure you take it to this power, if it's a T, put a T. If it's an X, put an X. All right, so I think you can see that a lot, oh, wait, I did add, that's, that's right, I forgot. I did add on here a matching, um, and, and it's matching on the test as well, because your review actually didn't have a question like one of the questions that was on the test, and so I had made this one up to make sure that we talked about it. It's basically asking you to match each equation to each graph, and the graphs are actually given, okay? So, some things to look at are, where is it crossing the y-axis? This one here is crossing, now it's not given on this right here, but if you look at these A values, it's either going to be 10, 25, or 50. So it looks like this one is maybe 10, this is 25, and this is 50 if you kind of go up those. So sometimes you got to kind of figure things out, all right? Now, looking at the one that crosses at 10, there's only one of them crossing there. So notice that's what this equation is right here. So I'm going to call this one blue. Um, I'm sorry if any of you are colorblind. It's this one right here, if you look over where I just drew on the graph. It's where it's blue, though. It's the one crossing at 10. Then there's three of them that are crossing at 25. So can you figure out which is which? Okay, now, just look at now these values. Two of them are, are, are decay and one of them is growth. So if you look at the ones that are over here at 25, I'm talking about these three graphs that cross right here, okay, it looks like the red one, this one that you see right here, is the one that is the growth. So that one is y2. So here, maybe that's how I should do this. This one's y1, that one's y2. Okay, now the other two are decay. So then you have to figure out, okay, well, this yellow one that's coming down, which comes down like this, and it's, it's this one right here that I'm talking about, 
versus this one, you can see that they decay at different rates right there. So one thing you could do to help yourself out if you're not sure which is which, is you could go to your calculator and to your graph, you could clear this out, and you could put those two equations in to determine which is which. It's 25 and then 0.2 to the x, and the other one, hold on, I have an extra parenthesis right there, and the other one is 25 and then 0.8 to the x. You would have to set your window to what this looks like it's set at, though. So it would at least have to go on the y-axis. The y-max would have to at least go up to 50, but it looks like it's maybe going to 100 there. And let me just go by, um, what did I go by there? Tens, I think. But this is a good way to then figure out. So the first one, that's that one that's steeper. It's the yellow one on the graph on your paper. And then this one here, did I put the equation in right? 0 0.8, 0 0.2, yeah. 0 0.8, 0 0.2, because it looks like one of them is a little bit, you know, steeper than that, or not quite as steep. Probably because my X is, it looks like my X's go by ones, like this is one, two. But whatever case, I, I will change that in just a second to show you, but you can kind of see how um, one of them is closer to the y-axis, the blue one's closer to the y-axis and comes down closer to the x-axis sooner. Or you could change your window to say from negative one to two right there and then the graphs will look a little bit closer. There's like the yellow one and then this one is like the black one. Okay, so how did I put them in? It goes yellow, black, so the point 0.2 is the yellow one, and so, let's get back here, the point 0.2, this one here, is your Y6, and then this one here would be your Y3. Okay, so now that takes you to the other two equations. One of them has a, it's growing faster, like this number is bigger, so it's growing faster, it's steeper. This one would be the green one over there, Y5. And then this one would be Y4. But again, you could take and you could graph them on your calculator to help you to match those up. All right, so some advice. Exam 4 should be completed by the deadline, which is given to you. I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. I think I give you a two-day window that you can take it. Um, you have flexibility to do it, you know, to complete it when you want. You don't have to do it during the class time. I know that all of your schedules are really crazy right now. Some of you have kids home that you don't normally, you know, you have time to yourself, you know, because they're at school, that sort of thing. Um, so you need to do it when you need to do it. If that means you're doing it from at midnight, you know, on Monday night, then that's fine, you know. It will log you off the test when your time is up. You have two hours to take the test and you must complete it in one sitting. I am aware that you may be trying to use your notes when taking this test. I can't stop you from doing that. However, if you rely on them too heavily, you will run out of time to finish the test. So you need to understand that. I will instantly know if you run out of time, then it means you didn't know how to do the material. So you should be dinged in some way if that's the case. Um, I know you didn't sign up for this class to be online. I didn't either. It's a lot more work for me to have it this way than to come and see you guys. I'd rather see you guys. Uh, but make sure before you try to complete the test that you complete the exam form review problems first. They will be very helpful. It will get you up to speed with doing the problems. And then, of course, you'll be able to get done in time. Um, so if you have questions, please email me. Let me know. I'll try to answer those as I get those as they come in. So you guys have a good night. Good luck on your test.